destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, September 1st, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Ruth Conniff, editor-in-chief of the Wash- uh, Wisconsin Examiner, excuse me, and author of Milk, How an American Crisis Brought Together Midwestern Dairy Farmers and Mexican Workers. Meanwhile, in a shocker, Sarah Palin has lost in Alaska's special election in its first ranked choice voting election to Democrat Mary Haltola will be the first Alaska native in Congress. The FDA has authored the first redesign, authorized, I should say, the first redesign of the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines targeting the new sub-variants of the virus. They should be available as soon as next week. More polls are showing a surge in Biden's approval rating. Quinnipiac has his approval rating at its highest since September of last year, 40% to 52% disapproval compared to 31% to 60 in July. Jackson, Mississippi is still without safe drinking water, an overwhelmingly black city that's been neglected by the state for quite a while and uh, had a shoddy water system for decades because the state, you guessed it, outsourced its infrastructure to a private contractor, which uh, ended up not doing the job, and then there was a lawsuit, so. Reports indicate that the DOJ will probably wait until after the midterms to announce any charges against Trump. Does he announce his presidential run before that to uh, subvert that? Hmm. Could be. Trump lawyers are scrambling to cover their butts now that they might have to be witnesses into the probe into Trump's document hoarding. Did they know that their client withheld classified files in defiance of the initial subpoena? Hmm. Peter Thiel and Mitch McConnell are playing hot potato with Blake Masters' uh, Senate funding. No one wants to pay for this loser's campaign sad i feel like if he was your teacher's assistant you should have to pay for his campaign so peter Thiel should pony up that's the rules in pakistan the who is estimating that at least three million children are in need of humanitarian assistance due to devastating flooding that will likely spread waterborne disease and cause malnutrition and lastly an israeli court has sentenced the Palestinian leader of a charity, Mohammed El Halabi, Gaza's director for World Vision International, to 12 years in prison. This is a part of them cracking down on NGOs as a way to just continue to subjugate the Palestinian people. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, it is the M Majority Report Thursday. Very excited. To be back with you um let's let's get right into it here because the midterms are nearing and i'm quite amused by the story about about uh blake masters washington post had a story yesterday about how peter Thiel and mitch mcconnell are playing hot potato with the funding for blake masters blake masters uh, Senate campaign, and no one seems to want to fund this guy. Here's a video for maybe why 
there's less enthusiasm from the Republican donor side of things to, to back somebody like this who, in my opinion, has some of the least charisma of any Republican Senate, Senate candidate uh, this cycle. Yeah. And that's saying a lot. And let's just be clear about what this is. This is a guy who is seeing the money dry up, seeing his benefactors kind of give him the cold shoulder a little bit. He's had to run away from his original positions on abortion and the stolen election. So now he needs to double to get some people energized with a little bit of edgelordism. And let's see him attempt that. Well, this tweet made people mad. Newsweek wrote, oh, Blake said that women and minorities are hurting the economy. Fake news. Look, I don't care if every single employee at the Fed is a black lesbian, as long as they're hired for their competence, not because of what they look like or who they sleep with. News for Joe Biden. We are done with this affirmative action regime. You know, I can't think of a single policy since the end of Jim Crow that's been worse or more divisive for race relations in this country. Race quotas are wrong. Gender quotas are wrong. They're unjust. They're illegal. But the Democrats are addicted to this kind of identity politics garbage. They just care about how you look, he not whether you're right the best there. quality. It said identity politics garbage. I'd also say, like, if you're just like some uh, Peter Thiel's teaching assistant from Stanford, uh, you might not be the best expert on the worst policies for black America since Jim Crow. I mean... I think redlining probably would uh, uh, put itself up uh, there. But anyway, I think he, he means that like this is basically against white people. Um, so qualified or whether you can do the best job. You know, if you want to see the affirmative action regime on display, just look at Biden's White House. Biden promised that he would choose a woman for his VP. Then, of course, he chose Kamala Harris. So incompetent, she can't even get a sentence out. But I've never oh, spoken to can anyone who can say with a straight yeah. face that. Interesting. I mean, well, first of all, that that's a bit of a dog whistle. But would that would you say that uh, engaging in those kinds of politics is at least reminiscent of identity politics? I mean, yeah. And he, first of all, he says garbage earlier in the clip. Like he, this is not a masterful speaking no. performance. Uh, pun, pun intended. He looks. He. This is this is beneath the dignity of the of Senate office. Honestly, <laughs> like this guy looks like a YouTube streamer. Yeah. That like is complaining he got a content moderation strike. He's he's just like doing a poor job of imitating Charlie Kirk and Stephen Crowder, yeah. and and he's running for Senate against like this is not a galvanizing electoral strategy as a way to just you know uh throw jabs at kamala harris's speaking ability it's one thing if you're trump and you have that cachet but it's another thing if you're somebody who can't even hold my attention as i'm doing a show watching him like speak right there he is not th there's he does not have any fundamental underpinning that's going to uh, no. have him have success just b essentially because he was propped up by a guy like peter Thiel. um as a way to, I don't know, serve those kinds of interests. Yeah, he's a courtier, and Peter Thiel tried to, tried to give him a position. And and now he's abandoning him, which is the Great. funniest part of this it's year. So, so this is from the Washington Post. After J.D. Vance won the Republican primary for Senate in Ohio, minority leader Mitch McConnell called Peter Thiel, the billionaire investor who had pumped $15 million into a super PAC backing Vance, to congratulate him, but also to make a request. Since McConnell's resources were limited, a.k.a. he's giving money to candidates he thinks are more likely to win, the senator said, would Teal continue to finance Vance through the general election? Teal demurred, according to a person familiar with the May exchange who, like others interviewed for this article, spoke on the condition of anonymity to describe private discussions. Essentially, um, the Washington Post writes, in the ensuing weeks, a high-stakes game of chicken would play out between McConnell and Teal, uh, this is over the, the past few months, culminating in a move last Friday by a super PAC linked to the minority leader, the Senate Leadership Fund, to abandon about $8 million worth of TV, radio, and digital ads originally booked to boost masters. The move was preceded by a pair of phone calls last week in which Teal spoke to McConnell and the Kentucky Republicans' top fundraising lieutenant, Stephen Law, who heads the Senate, Senate Leadership Fund. McConnell told Teal over the phone last week that Vance's race in Ohio was pro uh, proving more costly for the Senate Leadership Fund than anticipated. Hilarious. Hilarious. Another Peter Teal uh, boy. Boy, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say apprentice, but boy is more apt. <laughs> 
that money was not unlimited and that uh, there was a need for the billionaire to come in in a big way in Arizona as a person familiar with the conversations described his words. Mm. Law, in a call with Teal uh, the day before his group cut back on the Arizona ads, expressed concern about Masters as a candidate and pessimism about his company uh, campaign's viability. Um, both Vance and Masters are friends and former business associates of Teal's. Masters stepped down from roles and uh, blah, 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 blah. But essentially, uh, the article goes on to describe that... Um, or this, this de detail's too good for me to skip over. The message from McConnell and Law, according to people with knowledge of, of their pitch, was that they should essentially split the cost with Teal cutting a check to their super PAC matching whatever funds they put behind Masters. Another option, these people said, was that the Teal-funded super PAC could take over the ad reservations initially made by the McConnell-linked group. Teal indicated to them that he was not interested in such arrangements. Oh, thank you. A posture say... Uh, people around the venture capitalist that is informed by his approach of investing early and a belief that any more of his money oh, would be used so funny. as a democratic talking point. He is still hosting fundraisers for masters in the coming weeks. He flooded the, the primary process with money. And now in the general election, he's leaving his guy hanging them out to dry because he doesn't believe in it. That's so funny, his investment strategy of investing early in companies and then getting out. Like you got lucky with some investments early on, but we have to start asking the question, if both Vance and Masters lose, you know, we all have just reason to suspect like Peter Thiel of being a, basically a fascist or monarchist type of guy. Or is he a secret Democrat mm. putting up these little fail, uh, little Silicon Valley boys to uh you know secure the senate for the democrats and all like i mean maybe maybe that's what greenwald was doing all along too when he was um retweeting blake masters and jd vance campaign ads maybe he was just helping the democrats long undercover campaign the two of them um thanks guys it is just wonderful to watch mcconnell and peter teal like two crappy divorced parents fighting over uh you know if they're going to have the custody of their kid for the weekend, because they'd rather be out like partying or something like that. <laughs> I'd rather be spending my money on my boat. That's the vibe I get. So yeah, Teal can spend it all he wants, but he basically says, Hey, you're on your own now, dude. I'm not helping you out. Even yeah. though they're supposed to be immensely close, both Vance and, uh, and masters are getting thrown under the bus by this guy. And they are not independent of him at all. No more money is going to change anything. Everybody knows that, the only career experience Blake Masters have is basically compiling uh, Peter Thiel's dual monopoly lectures at Stanford into a book. Yeah. And that's all he's ever done. <laughs> that's his entire thing. Uh, so, like, it doesn't matter if you stop giving him money. Everyone knows he's just your teaching assistant uh, and you're trying to make him a senator. Good luck with that. You should cough it up, Peter. Yeah. And people already know that. And no amount of money being given to him in the general election would change that perception. No. It's just such a flimsy excuse. That's all but the hilarious know about one. Him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the other story I wanted to highlight at the top of the show was uh, I mentioned the Sarah Palin loss in the special election. Now, this was Alaska's first ranked choice election. Um, and it was a special election for Don Young's seat who passed away. He held that office for nearly 50 years. It's uh, Alaska's lone house seat. And now Alaska has joined Maine as the first two states to elect someone to Congress um, with ranked choice voting, which is interesting. I mean, Maine is experimental in this kind of way, but Alaska, some, some of these states with smaller populations, you see them making some of these gambles. And in this instance, it really did pay off, one, because Sarah Palin, who's a total clown, lost, but two, because the ranked choice system appears to have worked as intended. Um, most of the uh, voters in Alaska used their first choice on one of the Republican candidates. There was another candidate named Nick Beg Begich, and... Um, he was there, a, a lot of voters' second choices. But in terms of, if I'm getting this right, his voter, his first choice voters, a lot of them did not rank Sarah Palin as their second choice, which in the second round of voting allowed it to break 
in the way uh, in, in favor of the, the Democratic candidate Peltola, who is a, a former state lawmaker and will be, I believe, the first Alaskan native representative from Alaska. And she's a Democrat. Uh, Palin was already vulnerable because according to polling in Alaska, the three in five Alaskans have a negative view of her. And that's kind of amazing given the fact that her celebrity was so tied to her identity in Alaska. But like she left the governor's office early. She decided to have a reality show, totally messy, totally incompetent. And I, it seems like despite the state being red, people understood that. Um, yeah. I mean, she's there's in all these sort of Western states. I mean, North Dakota is similar thing too. Like, there's a big distrust of like the big city media and that sort of stuff. And she just went to hang out in Fox News green rooms instead of doing her job. And like, apparently, with active active COVID, eating in Upper East Side restaurants despite claiming to be unvaccinated, she really she had her her relationship with Alaska is half assed, and it seems like voters understood that. Um, but here are some clips. They're a little too small. I wish the reporter had kept um, filming for a little while. Yeah, give us the raw footage, guys. But you get a glimpse of Sarah Palin as she starts to understand that she's losing and she begins to spiral, blaming ranked choice voting in general. Ooh, rope legs. Voting. Yeah. When it comes down to second and third place votes, that's going to uh, decide who's, who's, who's going to win. I mean, really? Alaskans want Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi? That's kind of just a little bit of it. And then here's a video of her as she realized that she's essentially lost because I think that was as votes were coming in. She's cutting this cake. Uh, spirits trying to keep them high. She's realizing mm. that, uh, yeah, I'm going to lose this election. This cake isn't going to taste as good as you wanted it to. Surprise, but uh, knowing that the task in front of me is to explain to Alaskans why ranked choice voting is not in the public's best interest. Oh! Do Alaskans really want to be like they have said? So, I mean, she's she's uh, ranting about ranked choice voting. Ranked now. choice loser is yeah. bad. <laughs> Sorry, that was the system. Those were the rules. This is like when Hillary Clinton was saying, well, I won the popular vote, but lady you didn't go to the states like you didn't go to michigan you didn't go yeah. to wisconsin those were the rules you understood that we no, sorry. Uh, you understood that the um th this was the system you had to win in the electoral college not in the popular vote. also this is just objectively a better system i'm not one of these people who thinks like electoral reform like um uh getting rid of first past the post is the only thing politics needs or even like the main thing we should emphasize because i think like the New York mayor race uh, had a bad example of uh, right. going wrong, for instance. But it is objectively better than first past the post. <laughs> like, and, but look at New York 10. Say if we had had ranked choice voting right. in that instance. One, you know, the progressive should have consolidated beh behind yes. Yulene New. But uh, another point to be made is that, you know, a lot of people would have made her her second choice if they voted for Mondaire Jones or Carolina Rivera. Right. right. Like strategically think about it. Like. It's it's obviously not empirical, but you could not. I would never ever think that a number one Carlina Rivera voter, or Mondaire Jones voter, or even Liz Holtzman and Joanne Simon were putting Daniel Goldman second. Right. But no. Yeah. Exactly. I think, I think he would have been out after his first first uh, choice votes. Honestly. Yeah. The fifty percent of progressive candidates that got those those votes of like yeah. five or six people. Right. I, I mean, we we need to, I think, again, it's not number one priority, as you say, Matt, but this should be a system that begins to be replicated throughout the country. In New York, the reason we had it for the mayor's race and not for the federal races is because it's only applying right now to citywide yeah, uh, it races. It was through, via ballot measure for the city that we uh, New Yorkers voted to, you know. But I want this more for federal right. elections, right? Um, yeah, and Sarah Palin should ask herself why so many people left her off their rankings. <laughs> that's a, oh, that's no. a simple question. That would be a little bit too introspective for me. Um, God. But, but yeah, so that's... It, it's a good result there um and there will be another election this is a special election but for the time being um that this is the this is a, a success and why did she run again because what I else is she gonna do is dried up yeah tom cotton was already tweeting about how ranked choice voting is a way to steal elections
So that's going to be their new their new talking point about this. And then I saw some Axios guys saying that the rank choice system was it's so convoluted that it undercuts faith in the electoral process. So uh, maybe we shouldn't do it all together. Oh, uh, yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. Right. No, we create more democratic systems and infrastructure. And uh, if like it's like saying we shouldn't it, it was like that take that Andrew Yang had that we shouldn't. Uh, target trump with an investigation because of what the blowback might be no yeah, that's no. you don't make uh systemic decisions or big uh, decisions about law and about election structures based on potential blowback that's the the language of losers and weakness yeah make election day a national holiday and people don't have time to brush up on it biden should do that by the way i, I think you know he you need to it needs to go through congress apparently um but hey hold the vote with that said we have a message from our sponsor before we get to our next guest and i think the audience might enjoy this ad read isn't it crazy that in 2022 stop laughing bradley <laughs> We still have high-speed internet, celebrities going to space, and electric cars, and yet, people are still cleaning their bums the way our Victorian brothers and sisters did. With toilet paper? Come on. Step into the 21st century and upgrade your bathroom routine and start washing your bum with Hello Tushy bidets. Because smearing your business around with toilet paper is so 100 years ago. The Hello Tushy bidet attachment washes your bum with fresh water for a way better clean than toilet paper. Simply spray and pat dry. It attaches to your existing toilet. No electrician or plumber needed. It's very, very easy. It installs in less than eight minutes and cuts down on your TP use by 80%, which saves you money and paper waste. I mean, think about how much money you spend on toilet paper uh, every year. And then it'll you'll quickly come to the conclusion that investing in the Hello Tushy bidet is probably more cost efficient, definitely more cost efficient. Hello Tushy has cleaned over 1 million happy bums. I want all of our listeners to have clean bums. That is my, that is my ultimate desire for you. Visit hellotushy.com. Tushy is spelled T-U-S-H-Y.com slash majority to get 10% off plus free shipping right now that's hellotushy.com slash majority for 10 percent off and tag at hello tushy on social media so they can celebrate your clean bum with you that's hellotushy.com slash majority for 10 percent off all right we're going to take a quick break and when we come back we'll be joined by ruth conniff editor-in-chief of the washington wisconsin examiner and author of milked how an American crisis brought together Midwestern dairy farmers and Mexican workers. Be right back. We are back, and we are joined now by Ruth Conniff, editor-in-chief of the Wisconsin Examiner and author of Milked, How an American Crisis Brought Together uh, Midwestern Dairy Farmers and Mexican Workers. Ruth, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, great to be with you. Of course. So um, your book centers around reporting that you did both in Wisconsin and in Mexico, where you lived for a while. Um, and it was on, it's on the role of immigrants in the dairy industry uh, in, in the U.S. What was the genesis of this idea? How did you come to wanting to, to write about it? Well, uh, my family and I went to live in Mexico for a year right after Trump took office. We decided to take the kids there to get away from the United States, to have kind of a cultural immersion experience. Uh, and it was a great year. And just as we were leaving, 
I read a news article in Wisconsin about Mexican workers who were packing up and driving all the way back to Mexico from Wisconsin dairy farms where they had been working for decades. Um, things had gotten uglier politically. Um, they were getting yelled at in the street. They felt uncomfortable. The parents were undocumented and were, the children were afraid their parents would be snatched off the street. So there was a particular family that this article centered on. And it really captured my attention, partly because that was where I first learned that 80% of the labor on Wisconsin dairy farms is performed by undocumented immigrants, mostly from Mexico, which is a huge number. And I think not well understood. So I found this family when I was down in Mexico, I found the same truck that they'd driven all the way back from Wisconsin on the street and saw the house that they had built with the money they made milking cows. and became aware of this long-term relationship between people who lived in these little mountain towns in Veracruz, Mexico, and people in rural Wisconsin, the dairy farmers who really depend on their labor and have been working with them uh, for many years, about two decades. So what does some of that work look like in terms of hours and, and how difficult it is, uh, and also just the relationship between some of these workers with their employer? It's hard physical labor. Um, you know, people are working from four o'clock in the morning until six, seven at night. They're mucking out barns. They're cleaning up manure. They're attaching the milking equipment to cows' udders and milking the cows. Um, and what's interesting is they started doing this a couple of decades ago because farms, Wisconsin is the number one state in the union for farm bankruptcies. And part of what has driven that is that there's this enormous pressure to get big or get out. And so little family farms have been going under at the rate of one or two a day. And the ones that have survived have had to grow very rapidly. So around the year 2000 and the late 90s, a lot of small family farmers who had never employed anybody but their own family members before began hiring workers. Couldn't find workers locally who wanted to do these long, grueling jobs and found some Mexican workers who were working as seasonal employees on local Christmas tree farms. And that was the beginning of a relationship that has become absolutely essential to the dairy industry here. So the, can you talk and expand a little bit more on the, the fact that all of these larger farms seem to be edging out smaller farms at this uh, rapid rate in, in Wisconsin and, and where, when that began um, and just, and honestly, too, how farming subsidies from a federal level play into that consolidation. Well, I mean, part of the problem is that there's been a shift over many years, accelerated by global trade agreements like NAFTA, to creating crops and milk as a, as a commodity that's traded on the global market instead of sort of local food systems where this food is sold locally and prices are sort of measurable, sustainable. They follow a regular cycle. Instead, you've got this tremendous global economy, this huge pressure on farmers to grow giant soybean crops, to grow corn. Um, and in, under NAFTA, the United States dumped a lot of subsidized corn on Mexico. And that drove a lot of Mexican farmers off their land. And that created this rush of immigration across the border as people were looking for jobs after they lost their farms. What's interesting is that these two groups of rural people in the United States and Mexico are really under pressure from these same global economic mm. forces. And they have that in common. And that's sort of contrary to the political narrative of rural voters in the Midwest voting for Donald Trump and, you know, buying into a lot of the Republican anti-immigration rhetoric, um, which they do. They, I mean, a lot of the farmers in my book were Trump voters, but they really depend on and appreciate the undocumented workers who are coming to do these jobs. And they know that those workers are not replacing anybody. Um, you know, replacement theory having been popularized in part by our U.S. Senator Ron Johnson, the idea that these workers are coming and taking Americans' jobs, they could not find Americans to do these jobs. So I feel like getting at that relationship and understanding both on, the, you know, the sort of personal relationship level and the huge economic relationship level what the reality is, it really kind of unravels that anti-immigrant narrative. It's just amazing that I'm sure Ron Johnson and Republicans, lawmakers in Wisconsin, have an understanding that migrant workers are absolutely essential to these businesses remaining afloat, these farms. And yet it is his rethoric on border hawkishness, hawkishness is uh, up there with anybody. 
yeah, and Ron Johnson has been rushing down to the border, warning darkly about this, you know, open border and these immigrants rushing across. And and meanwhile, in his state, his, you know, this major industry, dairy, is that, you know, we were the dairy state until California surpassed us in volume, but it's a huge deal in Wisconsin, is 80% dependent on these people's labor. So it is, it, it's really contrary to reality. And one thing that really illustrates that, I think, is in our governor's race this year, the Republican candidate, Tim Michaels, is a construction company executive. And when he was the head of the road builders lobby, that lobby group pushed really hard not to penalize employers for hiring undocumented immigrants. And the reason is they are heavily dependent on undocumented labor. Yeah. And yet he brags about building the prototype for Trump's border wall. And he has the same very harsh anti-immigrant rhetoric that a lot of Republicans have. And, and they know better. So you mentioned that in ironically, the struggle of Mexican farmers and, uh, what some of these Wisconsin dairy farms are undergoing is quite similar due to globalization and NAFTA. Um, can you talk a bit about more about how many jobs Mexico lost after NAFTA and how that affected migration coming to the United States in search of jobs? Well, about 900,000 Mexican farmers were driven off their land, subsistence farmers, directly after NAFTA and the dumping of cheap corn that was subsidized corn from the United States. So that is one number. I mean, there are many other statistics about that trade deal, but what that directly created was migration, migration to Mexico City and other big cities in Mexico and migration across the border, which has been a, a reality since you know, we created the Bracero program in this country to recognize that we were relying on Mexican workers to come seasonally and harvest crops in the United States. So it's not a new idea that Mexican workers come work here for a while, send money home, and then go back. And in fact, remittances from the United States, Mexican workers' wages that they're sending back home are the largest source of foreign income. It's about $50 billion. It's more than, than the income from petroleum and this petroleum wow. Country, so it's a you know it's a long-standing economic reality. What has happened in this case in the dairy industry is that workers are staying to do year-round jobs, and there is no year-round visa for low-skilled work uh, by immigrants in the United States. So that's that's why almost every worker on a dairy farm in the United States and any year-round agricultural worker is here without documents. And NAFTA paired with increased border hawkishness also has resulted in a uh, an interruption of what used to be more circular migration where uh, workers would come across the border, make money and then return. Um, can you talk about those two policy choices <laughs> uh, kind of creating this these very specific set of conditions that make things really difficult? for migrant workers in this country. Yeah, it's ironic because the moral panic over immigrants coming to the United States, immigrants who, by the way, have a much lower lit rate of committing crimes than people who were born here. Um, so that moral panic is really, it's very hyped up. Um, it, it has created a militarized border, which makes it both dangerous and expensive to cross. And so when people come here, they don't go back and forth as much as they used to. The pattern now is for people to stay for a very long time, which is painful for families that are separated for years and years. And it creates this strange situation where we have US industries that are absolutely reliant on these workers. The workers cross, you know, in the trunk of a car, walking across the desert, you know, take these dangerous crossings, pay about $11,000 to do it, work for most of a year to pay back that money that they borrow from relatives and friends and then stay here for a decade or two decades, because once they go back, there's no guarantee they're ever coming to the United States again. Um, and they're sending money home to these villages that I visited with a group of farmers from Wisconsin who go every year to see the families of their undocumented workers, where they are building roads, houses, businesses, create, you know, supporting this whole community with money that they're sending home from the farms in the United States. It is. It, it just is jarring because um, it sounds cou counterintuitive to people because of so many decades of um, fear mongering about the border. But the fact is, of the matter is that m more heavily militarizing the border creates more 
I'm using this term just because that's what they would use, illegal immigration in terms of just like, as opposed to a more fluid border system where uh, it would be less treacherous, people would die less. I mean, people die, get maimed trying to cross the border. And also it would serve, uh, so, I mean, from from the dairy farmer's perspective or from other farmer's perspectives, it would serve them better to in 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 a sense absolutely i mean it makes more it creates more illegal immigrants in the united states in two ways one is people stay here longer who want to go back and would rather be going back to see their families and have the option to come across but secondly it just makes a system illegal that is economically a reality and has been for decades and u.s industries not just agriculture, more than anybody, agriculture, but also construction, food service, hospitality. They know it. They know that they're depending on these people, that they can't find Americans to do these jobs. And so just declaring that illegal instead of making it possible for people to do it legally creates a bunch of people who are, you know, in their their status is not legal and that's not necessary. And also, I would imagine, by the wages in and of itself, but um, but also the conditions, it creates a bit of um, a, a a treacherous situation from a work perspective for some for a lot of these workers who are getting paid way too little working way too hard and don't have um don't have recourse from the government it, it just they're they're it's almost like they're invisible but it's uh it, it's it's scary <laughs> yeah. I mean, people have no protection. They're really right. vulnerable and they're vulnerable to wage theft and abuse. And there's some of that in my book. Um, but what really most interested me was actually the very warm relationship between the farmers and the workers in my book, because they see themselves as having some real similarities. And the farmers, when they go back on these trips, they describe seeing scenes of neighbors helping neighbors to build homes and kind of all pitching in and doing this work as something like a scene from their own childhood in the 1960s in rural Wisconsin, where those farms are disappearing. You drive down the highway and you don't see cows from the road anymore. They're all indoors. You know, there's a whole way of life that's fading very rapidly on both sides of the border. And here are these people who see themselves as having this agrarian background in common. And that I found really interesting. So yeah, talk a bit about more some uh, some of those stories um, of, of people that you spoke with, uh, and, and your books is centered around both in terms of your time in Mexico and uh, and your time in reporting in Wisconsin. Well, my book opens with uh, this seventy year old farmer Stan Linder who drives down every year. He's been going on this trip um, since two thousand one when the trip started because a local Spanish teacher at a small town high school in Alma, Wisconsin started, she was translating on the farms and she started taking the farmers down to try to learn Spanish in Mexico. And then they began going every year to visit the families of their workers because it made such a deep impression on them. So he drives down there every year. And when I went on the trip, we went into a restaurant in um, Veracruz and these two women came running up to him and hugged him and were brought him a bottle of tequila. And Stan and his granddaughter sat down and polished off this whole bottle of tequila between them. These women were making fun of them, making fun of their Spanish, teasing them kind of gently, but um, it was a long-term relationship that they had had. And the the women, Luisa Tepoli and Blanca Hernandez had worked in Minnesota and Wisconsin for years and years milking cows and now have started businesses in this town, welcome these farmers every year. Um, I spoke on the cell phone from the uh, school supply store that one of them set up, Luisa Tepoli, with a farmer in Minnesota who had hired her and he said, you know, these people are just the salt of the earth that I could not have done. Uh, I couldn't have done what I've done without them. I really needed her and her sister and the other people who came from that town to work here. Um, and the farmers themselves kind of had this fascinating experience going to parties that were thrown for them in these towns and uh, seeing more of a subsistence lifestyle. And like I said, sort of recognizing something from their own childhood that they felt nostalgic about there. So it's a it's interesting, you know. It's an interesting close relationship. I think it shows how people are not just um, political labels because these are rural Trump voters. They helped put Trump over the top in 2016, um, but they're not anti-immigrant. And um, and there's a more complex relationship there. And the complexity, I think, is also reflected in terms of just 
I mean, I, I, I'm focusing, I focus on the lower wages, right. And, and some of those, um, it, the fact that these workers should be getting paid more, but part of the issue with it as well is that the farmers themselves are being squeezed out by these larger conglomerates. Um, can you talk about the, that dynamic and how that trickles down affects both the smaller farms and the, the workers, um, despite the fact that there is like this small, almost family farming relationship, um, between some of the workers and their employers. Yeah, I mean, in Wisconsin, which is the number one state in, in the United States for farm bankruptcies, um, one of the statistics that's sort of fascinating from the state agriculture department is that as we have lost about half of our family farms since 2007, the number of cows has stayed exactly the same. So those cows are no longer on 50 cow, 100 cow family farms, they're on, 8,000 cow, 30,000 cow, giant operations. And that is a very different landscape. And it comes with a lot of environmental costs um, and food system costs, you know, and it's, it's, I mean, where my book ends up going is talking about how do we restore a more livable, humane economy where people don't have to leave Mexico for two decades and leave their children behind to earn money up here in this very tenuous setup. Uh, and wait for their life to begin as they keep sending home money, which is really hard on people. Uh, and how do farmers sustain themselves? And how do we have a food system that's not so vulnerable? Because during the pandemic, we saw how vulnerable our mm. far flung food system really is. So setting up working local economies, food economies, in both in Mexico and the United States is a, you know, it's a goal of something called the food sovereignty movement, and people who would like to retain that smaller scale agricultural way of life um in in terms of maintaining that it what is the hope there given the fact that it seems like some of these larger conglomerates have been unshackled um and th when they have relationships with stores that are behemoths like walmart or um can't think of another example off the top of my head right now i don't know but um but but stores like that uh that the, it's difficult to to i guess breathe life back into some of these more sustainable systems yeah i mean there have been some successful efforts organic valley is one of them based in wisconsin which is a nationwide food cooperative um that's been very successful it started with vegetables and it's now mostly focused on dairy um helping it makes me feel good that's my milk of choice so there you go <laughs> Yeah, I mean, helping farmers make a reasonable income from selling their product. I think in organics, you've seen some of that. You've also seen Walmart get into the organic area, and that is causing the same kind of consolidation and price undercutting that happened in conventional food. But I think that is one answer, is that kind of cooperative movement. Another answer, of course, is to just have a, a legal year-round visa for workers so that that takes some of the pressure off the, the immigration aspect of it and the exploitation of people. Um, and then another answer is just for consumers to be more aware that, you know, paying really low prices for food has a really big cost in terms of environmental, uh, you know, the, the air we breathe, the water, particularly in Wisconsin, that's poisoned now by these CAFOs that are dumping manure into our water. Um, and for people. So if you buy artisanal cheese from a small local producer, that's a really different economic model from going to, you know, craft at the grocery store. Right. Um, and in terms of the, um, the, I wanted actually quickly to return to uh, some of the, the worker experience as well, because I am, um, it it is just I I feel like the the re most Americans don't fundamentally understand one what it's like in terms of being vulnerable to wage theft, not making so much money, doing all of this hard labor, but also the threat of deportation and um, having that all ripped out from under you. What what in your reporting did you find was um, the employer's response to say their employees potentially, or how employers, uh, set up their, their, their worker systems, uh, to either prevent 
to uh, to prevent their employees from being deported? And what were some of the employees um, fears about that happening to them? Well, in Wisconsin, the state legislature took away driver's licenses from undocumented people in 2007. So oh. since that time, a lot of workers have moved onto the farm because it's dangerous to drive. Um, a lot of drivers, you know, they're driving trucks anyway. They're going into town to get groceries. They get pulled over. Um, farmers are outraged. They go to court to bail out their employees and they feel really angry that the local sheriffs are setting up traps to catch people who look Latino. Um, so that's, that's one effect. Um, and that's one farmer response. There have been ice raids in Wisconsin. There were many more of them during the Trump administration than there are now, but that has driven some people to just decide to leave, a per particularly people with U.S. born children, like the, the family that I first went and saw in Mexico, who had two little boys who were born in Wisconsin. They started school in Mexico and their classmates made fun of them for speaking Spanish with a Wisconsin accent. Their parents were from Mexico, but they were from here. Um, and I talked to a, a young woman, a teenager, Jaziz, who grew up mostly in Wisconsin and has really fond memories and is back in Mexico, got stopped at the border and can't come back and misses her dad. And that's caused a lot of heartache in her life. He's still here, she's down there. Um, you know, the, the fear of deportation is just hanging over people all the time. And there's a town in Wisconsin called Arcadia where the largest furniture manufacturer in the world has its corporate headquarters and they employ a lot of undocumented immigrants. Uh, there were major ice raids in that area. And there was a successful lawsuit by an immigrant rights group called Voces de la Frontera that stopped that company from telling people they couldn't discuss their immigration status or their troubles with the employer with each other. Um, and, and that was a major advance. And that town is becoming a mostly Hispanic town. I mean, it's been revitalized. There are a lot of Mexican stores, grocery stores and restaurants on Main Street. The school would have closed because of low enrollment, because of rural depopulation, but it's instead thriving with about 80% Spanish speaking students. So that's kind of fascinating too, as you see the transformation of these little towns because of this immigrant population. And, and you know, in one generation, people are US citizens and they could end up being political leaders as well as business leaders, which is an interesting prospect. It doesn't take that long. Yeah, I mean, I'm just returning uh, in my mind to some of the insane outrage after some progressive lawmakers were calling to abolish ICE, as if ICE is this storied institution in the United States that wasn't created 20 years ago. And we obviously understand that its usefulness is, uh, well, you could argue it was never useful, but certainly outlived it. And they've now become just a force to terrorize and break up families, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's just, uh, it, it's just, uh, Upsetting. Um, but uh, you talked a bit about how low wage work, there's no eligibility for visas, which is um, really crazy uh, because this would solve a lot of these problems. Um, what is the reasoning behind that? Is it more just some of the rhetoric saying we want the best of the best coming into the country? We want doctors. Uh, you'll see that even on the Democratic side. That, that kind of rhetoric. Um, what What is the, the structure of the visa system that precludes that? Well, it, it grows out of this World War II era Bracero program, which was a seasonal program. So agricultural workers are allowed to come to the United States and, and follow the crop harvest and go back. They can't stay for a full calendar year. There is no visa category that acknowledges that that kind of work is going on. So it's just antiquated. And as far as immigration reform goes, it would be very easy to just create this category of visa. And I think the reason that it hasn't happened is that ever since comprehensive immigration reform fell apart in about 2014, blocked by Republicans, um, it, there was this moment when there was this bipartisan consensus. We, we have to fix our broken immigration system. We have to acknowledge the dependence of employers on these folks and we need to do something better. But since all of the pieces of that were lined up and then fell apart, it's been very hard to get consensus back together on any individual piece. And, and part of the problem is that immigrant rights activists are afraid that if we get one little piece, but we then we will never get justice for DACA recipients. We will never get a path to citizenship. We'll just allow farmers to employ workers year round milking their cows. 
So, I mean, that's yeah. part of it. But, uh, but hopefully, if there was more sunlight on this, then their wage theft would be lessened. There would hopefully be some less exploitive practices. Um, that, that I feel like is a hope one of the solutions that that we could be achieved here you know yeah and i also think that republicans really need to lose some elections with this anti-immigrant rhetoric because there are a lot of rural voters who are you know in very slim margins in wisconsin putting republicans over the top and who don't agree with that rhetoric and so i think really showing how hypocritical and wrong it is is really important that brings me uh, to lastly to, to Ron Johnson. Um, I, I would be remiss if I did not ask you to expand on uh, some of the points you made about him earlier, particularly because like this dude is in a tough uh, reelection fight, tougher than I think some people anticipated. Mandela Barnes is a great candidate, but um, you know, this, this guy, he, he said he was not going to run for a third term and he's just doing it anyway. I can't get over that. I feel like that would be something easy to run on like this. He's a total liar. But but what is the what has been on the ground in Wisconsin? Some of the reaction that you've seen, because he is a candidate. He's a Republican who could lose despite his uh, anti-immigrant rhetoric or maybe because of it in part. He's a vulnerable incumbent. And that's very interesting. And he was really Trump's chief enabler in the U.S. Senate. So he's, he's famous for saying all kinds of wacky things. Like if you get a COVID shot, it might kill you and, you know, beware. And uh, the replacement theory, he denies promoting this white supremacist replacement theory, but he does use language that definitely pushes those buttons. He's always talking about the threat of illegal immigration. What's interesting in Wisconsin is that he's underwater. He's behind about seven points in the polls. And in the latest poll, really interestingly, our very dynamic young African-American Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes is up by 14 points among independents who are evenly divided between Republican leaning and Democratic leaning independents. So these are the types of people that I talked to for my book, farmers who voted for Barack Obama and Donald Trump, people who liked Bernie Sanders and mm. who voted for Trump because he was throwing a rock at a system that has not served them well. And so I think understanding that that's a real possibility in Wisconsin, that Maverick candidates are often very popular here. Uh, Russ Feingold was a popular U.S. senator replaced by Ron Johnson. People see his kind of his Ron Johnson's unforced errors as a sign of authenticity. And I think that sort of partly feeds into that. But independents prefer Mandela Barnes. And you really can have the same voters who vote for a, a aggressive right winger like Johnson turn around and vote for a progressive candidate. So I think that the answer to Ron Johnson is not sort of a, a mealy mouthed moderate who <laughs> kind of tries to walk a line. You have farmers yeah. who are really angry about NAFTA and they really like hearing from Barnes who's quite progressive. So yeah, it'll be very, it's a tight race. It's an interesting race. And it's, and I think that Johnson is very vulnerable. Has his uh, role in January 6th been something that people have uh, ha have have used against him just anecdotally for or, or you know, see that as a negative for him um, approaching the November election? It's just hard because people are so siloed. So, of course, Democrats are outraged that he tried to turn over the fake ballots for Trump after Wisconsin's electoral ballots for Biden were already submitted. And uh, Mike Pence's office refused to accept them from Johnson. Um, and he made comments that he was not the least bit worried about the January 6th insurrection, that the people who were storming the Capitol were good people. If they had been Black Lives Matter protesters, that would have worried him. I mean, he says awful stuff like that. But he's said so many ridiculous things and been reelected that I think the Democratic Party has decided they're running against him on the fact that he's out of touch with Wisconsinites. He says things like, we need to renegotiate Medicare and Social Security in the budget every year. We shouldn't guarantee those programs. I'm not sure why he thinks that's a winning thing to say. Um, he's against unemployment insurance expansion. He's a libertarian. Um, you know, he thought that COVID was only going to kill, you know, 3 million people maybe. So there's no reason why we shouldn't reopen business. <laughs> he just does this stuff that shows that he's completely out of touch with his constituents. So 
I think those are the those are the things that are more likely to bring him down than the tinfoil hat conspiracy stuff, which he's famous for. Well, uh, from your mouth to to God's ears, I guess. Uh, Ruth Ruth Conniff, editor in chief of the Wa- oh, Wisconsin Examiner. I have now almost said Washington Examiner three times here. Uh, author of Milked: How an American Crisis Brought Together Midwestern Dairy Farmers and Mexican Workers. Thanks so much uh, for your time today, Ruth. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right. With that said, folks, we're going to wrap up the free part of this program. But first, Matt, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Uh, yeah, some fun stuff. Uh, there's a live show October 23rd at the Terragram Ballroom uh, with This Is Revolution, uh, Give Them Argument and uh, Left Reckoning. Also last night, well, we went, we did uh, uh, chat with some solidarity and above patrons for Left Reckoning. It was really fun. We had a... Um, a, a zoom when which a bunch of members joined including kowalski again from his tractor and we saw the dried up platte river uh which is a horrifying sight yeah. um and uh this weekend we're going to be talking to uh you at you girls about trump's legal jeopardy and tomorrow i'll be releasing a conversation on the lex stream maybe tonight i'm not sure um with uh, dr eric osgood about covid vaccines the new vaccines vaccine harms and things like that so uh you'll want to check that out yes you will all right um do we have uh binder and not yet all right that's fine um they'll be joining us shortly check out check out doomed check out scam economy the wonderful twin shows that uh the illustrious matt binder uh is the proprietor of and the discourse which is brandon sutton's uh show we will be joined by them in the fun half where we will be taking your calls and reading your IMs. 646-257-3920 is the phone number. Also, just a reminder, just, just coffee, uh, dot co-op, fair trade coffee, tea, and chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY and get 15% off, if I remember accurately. That's it. Okay, good. Um, you can get uh, some great coffee. I've been uh, getting their cold brew beans. For a little while now and uh, when i have that big purple or blue mug that's what's in that and that's when i'm really caffeinated i'm pretty caffeinated today though um so all over the place right now six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty see you in the fun half three months from now six months from now nine months from now and i don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now and i don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now But I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. Hold on for a second. Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Matt. What is up, everyone? Know me keen. You did it. Let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, Sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally 